This is Untangled, fly fishing for everyone. Presented by Ventures Fly Company. Hey everybody, welcome to it. This is Untangled and this is your host, Spencer Grant. We've got a fantastic episode like usual lined up for you here today. But before we jump into things, I want to start with some fun announcements. All right. Now, it, episode 16, this is episode 11, so five episodes from now. All right. Episode 16 is not just going to be your average run of the mill episode with me. No, we're getting the whole brain trust here at Ventures Flyco to come on the show. It's going to be me, Alex, and Berkeley, the two brothers who really started this uh, company up. We're going to be on the show together to talk about some new product announcements that are coming out, and we'll also answer questions that week as well. But we got some really fun products in the works, and we are stoked to share this stuff with you guys. So we're going to get on, and we're going to talk shop about the new stuff that we're doing and rolling out to everybody. So please make sure you do not miss episode 16. Okay, You definitely would not want to miss that one. It's coming up in five, count them, five episodes from now, which if everything goes correctly, should be five episodes from now. But you never know what might happen out here in the wilds of Wyoming or the hamsters running the wheel, the power of the generator to get the broadband to, or the dial up, excuse me, to connect out here. (laughs) It might not happen. All right. Oh goodness. It's been fun here in Wyoming lately, but the show today, all right, we are going to be uh, talking about the best flies for beginners to use. We're going to be talking about how your rig actually looks when you put some split shot on there, as in how does that look underwater, what to know about river flows. Okay, if you've ever seen those river flow graphs and you've looked at it and thought, you know, that looks interesting, but uh, what does it do? Well, we're going to explain that here. And then we're also going to dive in to the difference between deer body hair and deer belly hair. And I'll tell you what, there's a difference between my belly hair and my body hair. (laughs) Oh, that was probably TMI, wasn't it? But Hey, it made you laugh. So that's what we're here for, right? Okay. Oh, good times. So uh, before we do jump into the show today, uh, just usual reminder, if you have questions you would like answered, please click the link in the podcast description and submit your question. We'll get it answered here on the show. Uh, It might take a couple of weeks to get through questions, just depending on what kind of show I'm putting together. So if you've submitted one and it hasn't been answered yet, We'll get to it. I promise. We're, we're just sorting through. It just kind of depends on what sort of show I'm looking to put together that week. But we'll get to them. And I appreciate everybody that's done it so far. All right. Now, I do want to start before we get into questions. Um, just a little bit of a story and then lesson for you guys. Uh, I was out on the river yesterday here in Wyoming. It warmed up to it was 41 degrees yesterday i know i know should have been out there in daisy dukes and a crop top right (laughs) well no i was all bundled up in all my fancy waders and whatnot because it was still chilly out there but it was warm enough and i kid you not some some of y'all are gonna call bs on this that's fine but i got into a blue winged olive hatch yesterday I know that was my reaction too. I'm standing there on the river and I could see a whole bunch of midges coming off. And I thought the fish were coming up for midges. There was a hatch and the fish were coming up and eating. And I start looking at it more and I start seeing that classic little, you know, sailboat silhouette of a mayfly. And I'm like, shoot, it is February. It was the 18th is when I was out there. Like it's February 18th. What are the, what are the mayflies doing out this early? This ain't right. This ain't normal. Is it? Well, no, it's not. It's not even close to normal. But for whatever reason, the mayflies were out and I got into it. I caught probably a dozen browns on blue winged olives yesterday. It was a ton of fun. And I had, I kind of fished the whole hatch. We started out with the mergers and duns. Then I ended up with a sparkle dun catching most of those fish. So I share this story. All right. A, because it was finally warm enough in Wyoming to go fishing yesterday, but also because. You never know what's going to happen like that out on the river, right? So it's really easy to just sort of, uh, oh, well, the weather's not right today. I'm not going to go over. The flows aren't right. I'm not going to go. Or I don't know if I've got the right flies. I'm not going to. Well, look, if you start to like break down fly fishing and pick it apart 
you're going to find a million reasons to not go. Okay. Why would you spend the gas money? All right. You could buy at least half a thing of eggs with the money you spend on gas driving to the river and back these days. Okay. Why would you do that? You know, why would you spend whatever you spend on your gear to get there? And, you know, these, they got the brains the size of maybe a strawberry if they're really big fish, right? Why? What are you going to do? Spend your time throwing flies at those things? Well, it's a lot of fun. If you start thinking about it too rationally, you're going to talk yourself out of it. So don't, don't do that. Go out, have fun with it. All right. That's what, that's what it's here for. Right. So that's just my little get on the soapbox moment and remind you to have fun. Go out there. You never know what you're going to get into. And those, those were a lot of fun. Those were a lot of fun uh, getting those fish on dry flies yesterday. So Thanks for bearing with me through the story. Let's jump right into the questions. First question today on this wonderful episode here. Uh, I just started fly fishing and I'm wondering what flies do I need to buy and or tie? I just started getting into fly fishing. I can't find anything online about getting a starter fly box. It comes to us uh, from Connor from Washington. Well, Connor, I think it's safe to say that you came to the right place to ask this question. Now, congrats on getting started in fly fishing. This is going to be a ton of fun. Your bank balance is never going to be the same ever again. All right. Now, for starting out, the flies that you need that really is going to depend on where and what you're fishing for. All right. Uh, most fly fishing is trout focused. So I, I say most. I, I, I still think fly fishing skews heavily towards trout. I know there's tons of folks who are going after carp and bass and everything in the salt on it. And that's awesome. But I'm going to go ahead and assume that your question here, Connor, was uh, what flies should I look at uh, as a beginner to have and make sure that I've got uh, for my trout chasing adventures. Uh, now, as an aside here, though, before we do move on, I do want I, I use a lot of the same flies for bass that I use for trout uh, with bass, though, the big recommendation is. Uh, usually more streamers uh, than I would recommend anything else or than I would recommend to other beginning trout anglers just because like bunny hair leeches, like slump buster type patterns are really great. I've found for small mouth, especially in lakes. And, you know, if you're, if you're trying to only get the bare essentials, you probably really don't need a whole bunch of different streamers for trout. So that's going to be the main difference. Now you can use these for bass if you really want to, but Again, this list is going to be mostly trout centric. Now, you absolutely need, okay, for beginning flies, you need midges, caddis, mayflies, and woolly buggers. Those are your four right there. Of course, that's easier said than done, right? Which mayflies, which caddis flies, which midges? I just say, hey, go get this stuff. You know, it's like when my wife gives me a list to go to the grocery store with, and I go and I think I got what was on the list, but I didn't get what was on the list. And oh, I, I thankfully here, here's a little pro tip for anybody out there who wants it on the whole marriage thing, because I'm eminently qualified to give tips on marriage and fly fishing in the same podcast. Talk about a value proposition. Am I right? <laughs> oh, no, I've taken to calling my wife to clarify when I'm at a store because we have cell service even here in Wyoming. So I can I can do that. Right. Uh, that has saved a, a lot of miscommunication and frustration in the marriage, especially here where we're an hour away from Walmart. So it's not like I can just, oh, I'll just go grab the thing that I needed. You know, it's something we plan out in advance. Anyways, uh, <laughs> I'm not just going to throw Connor this list at you and expect you to understand it. Okay. What you need to do is you need to take that and get some information about the rivers that you're fishing and base the flies that you're going to use Around that list that I gave you, you need midges, caddis, mayflies, woolly buggers, okay? Which midge, which midge patterns should be using? Which caddis patterns? Which mayfly patterns? Well, that's going to be dictated by the river that you're fishing, all right? Because it's going to be different a little bit river to river, just different local flavor on patterns, local uh, hatches are just going to be different. So things are going to change. That's why I'm not really going to, be going to give a whole bunch of blanket advice here. We're just going to say, hey, make sure that you do your homework on the river and match the flies that you're picking to those four fly families that I 
mentioned. Now, this is one of the questions that we did try to answer here at VFC. We we were sitting down and we're like, okay, what kind of fly assortment would beginning anglers find the most helpful? How can we help anglers hit the water with everything that they need so you can go out there and spend more time actually getting into fish than worrying whether or not you've done the right thing to get into fish, if that makes sense. So if you're looking for a basic assortment of flies that's going to cover that, our essential collection is a stellar starting point. This is 40 flies. The assortment covers just about everything that you're going to need for chasing after trout, including those four families that I talked about, your woolly buggers, your midges, your caddis, and your mayflies. All right. So I would definitely recommend you take a look at our essential collection. We have other collections too, uh, but that essential collection is the one that I would recommend if you just want the the basics and you want to know that you're covered and you've got everything that you need to go out there and catch in some fish. So good question, Connor. Thank you very much. They say that fly fishing is supposed to be relaxing, peaceful, calming, but you spend all this time on the water frustrated that things aren't going the way that they should. It doesn't work like this in real life, only in the YouTube videos. Why can't I figure this out? Well, If that sounds like thoughts that have gone through your head when you've been on the water before, may I make a suggestion? Submit some of those questions, some of these pain points that you're having while on the water to Untangle so that we can answer them, dissect them, and give you information that you can act on to help turn those days on the river into the calming, wonderful, peaceful experiences that they're actually meant to be. Submit your question to get answered on Untangled today, click the link in the podcast description. Check out the website. Look in the email that you get every week from us. There's tons of ways to get in touch with us, and we can't wait to help you take that frustration down a couple of notches and just enjoy your day on the water. All right, our next question. This is a doozy of a question, and I mean that very complimentary. I promise. So this question is from Andrew from Colorado. Andrew asks, I've been learning a ton from listening to this podcast every week. Thanks for doing this. I've noticed a lot of the more experienced fly fishers and guides on the South Platte fishing a nymph rig with an egg or a worm as their lead fly. It seems like you'd expect those flies to sit at the bottom of the water column and roll along the bottom and therefore be your bottom fly. When fishing with split shot, how does your rig present underwater? Does the weight pull that lead fly, that lead fly, pardon me, that lead fly down to the bottom and do your second and third flies actually drift higher in the water column? If so, is the ideal rig a worm slash egg slash larva at the point, followed by a pupa and then an emerger? Bonus question, how do you read or interpret river flows and put them in the context of a particular river and how do you adjust your strategy accordingly? Andrew. You are a very intelligent person, and uh, that is that might sound sarcastic, but it is absolutely not. These are very good questions. These are the kinds of questions that you love to see anglers make, or <laughs> you love to see anglers ask as they make their progression through fly fishing. You, you kind of switch from wanting to know the what to wanting to know the why, and that's a big paradigm shift that to me at least shows that you're really starting to get fly fishing and really starting to understand that. So kudos to you for asking these questions. These are these are great questions. So I'm going to just try and dig into this as best I can and give you all, all the possible answers here. Uh, first off, though, thanks for listening to the show every week. That means a ton of us to hear VFC, especially me, because the podcast is kind of my baby. <laughs> Don't want to brag or nothing, but yeah, <laughs> I'm I'm kidding around. All right, uh, you've hit on something that's really unique in the fly fishing world here, Andrew. Because the first part of your question, I'm going to read it again, just so the listeners know where I'm going with this. Uh, the, it, talking about uh, experienced fly fishers and guides in the South Platte River fishing a nymph rig and either an egg or a worm is their quote unquote lead fly. So that. That would be like the first fly in your, oh, hitting everything over here. I need a bigger studio. (laughs) But that's your lead fly. So that's your first fly in your nymph rig. If you're fishing a traditional indicator nymph rig, uh, 
Uh, it's just the first fly below your indicator. It's also called the lead fly or the point fly. You might have heard of it described as that too. So you say you see a lot of fly anglers and guides fishing with a an egg or a worm in their lead fly, and it seems like you'd expect these those flies to sit at the bottom of the water column and roll along the bottom, and therefore, excuse me, and therefore be your bottom fly. So let's address that real quick. Uh, every big tailwater really is going to have its own playbook, its own take on the fishing rules, all right? And I said rules and air quotes if you're not watching the podcast. Uh, for example, I know guys who only fish the lower Provo River in Utah. That was my local tailwater growing up. Uh, but I know I know anglers who only fish that river with a certain rig and swear that it is the best way to fish. Okay, You have to fish the lower Provo this way or you're not going to catch fish. Is that how I fish it? No. Do I catch fish there? Yeah, I do. I... I prefer dry fly fishing, so I opt for using dry flies as often as I can. That's why I don't really use this rig, because it's a nymph rig. However, there is no doubt that it is an incredibly successful way to fish the lower Provo, and if the fish aren't biting, you throw that rig on, and you'll put a few in the net at the end of the day if you're persistent enough. All right? Uh, So what all this brings us to is if there's an accepted rig on a certain river, definitely pay attention to it. Guides are going to fish their rigs that way for a reason. They need to put fish in the net for their clients, right? You would definitely do well to imitate that. So I'm not telling you to just ignore the rigs, but remember that certain rigs are developed to do certain things. And by that, I mean, this rig on the lower Provo, for example, is developed to bounce along the bottom. Uh, and really, it's almost like a drop shot rig in a way, the way that this Provo River rig is is done up. It's like a drop shot. So if that's how you want to fish and you want to be successful that way, then go for it. But don't don't think just because that's what everybody does that's the only way to fish that river i don't want anybody to think that because there is no like one way to fish the river there's a lot of ways to come at this which is why this is such a fun pastime why it's such a fun thing to do because you can do it your own way you can put your own spin on this fly fishing thing and i would not want to comment directly on what guys are doing on the south Platte because that's not water that i'm intimately familiar with my guess as to why they're putting their egg fly first is that that is the biggest fly in their nymph rig. It's probably like a 16 or maybe even a 14, depending on uh, depending on the size of the egg pattern. And when you're setting up a nymph rig, it's generally accepted that you put your biggest fly first. So the largest sized fly is going to go first, followed by your smaller flies descending in order of their size. This helps the rig cast a ton easier. And it's going to drift a bit more naturally, too. Think about how uh, your leader is built. It's tapered, right? Big to thin. Same thing needs to happen with your nymph rig. Big to small on your tape on your nymphs. So that's why you're probably seeing this. My guess, again, I, I don't know the South Platte well enough to comment on s- certain rigs for the water. But my guess would be they're probably fishing like a 14 or a 16 egg or a San Juan worm up top. And then knowing what I do know about the South Platte, I know they love their tiny midges up there. So they're probably fishing like a size 20 and a 22 midge underneath that because that's what you fish on that river in a lot of instances, uh, especially the Cheeseman Canyon section. Uh, from what I know from uh, good old Pat Dorsey, always sharing his wonderful information and insight into that river. So that is... That would be my guess as to why that's happening. And in that sense, and that's just really how you'd want to rig it. You're going to get the best drift, even though, yes, you're right. We do want that egg on the bottom. In this sense, if you're fishing two really small flies with it, that egg has got to go first in your rig. All right. Now, for your question about split shot, let me read that bit about split shot again. When fishing with split shot, How does your rig present underwater? 
Does the weight pull that lead fly down to the bottom, and do your second and third flies drift higher in the water column? If so, is the ideal rig a worm slash egg slash larva at the point, followed by a pupa, and then an emerger? So once again, fantastic question, Andrew. All right. Uh, The goal with adding split shot is to make your rig heavy enough to quickly sink your flies so that they're drifting where the trout are holding and help keep those flies down at that proper depth. The scenario that you mentioned here is actually sort of like a drop shot rig where you have a lot of weight focused on the very bottom of your rig with tags above the weight and flies attached to those tag ends. Yeah, that's a a very traditional drop shot rig. Now, I want you to remember, what is it that you're trying to do with the nymph rig? Think about that for a second. You're trying to drift a series of nymphs through different water depths to ideally present those flies to fish in all of their potential holding water. That's why we're fishing not just one nymph. We fish two to three. We're covering as much of the water column as possible. So ideally, your nymphs will drift at the depth based on how far they are below your indicator. Adding split shot above that lead fly just speeds up that descent and helps hold your rig in place. That is the function of split shot. Your indicator is going to suspend that lead fly at that same depth, whether they're split shot or not. The split shot just increases how quickly it gets down to that depth. All right. Uh, Your other flies, assuming that they're weighted correctly, are going to sink below your lead fly. If you're fishing completely weightless nymphs, they might not sink all the way below that lead fly. It kind of depends on your rig, but there's not a lot of weightless nymph fishing, uh, at least not as much as I have, uh, as I remember seeing years ago. So the lead fly anchors your rig, and the other flies should follow it for a traditional nymphing rig. Now, you certainly can rig your nymphs to drift the way that you described in your question, That's not usually what you're trying to achieve with a traditional nymphing rig. And to wrap up your question here, Andrew, your final question was about river flows. Let me read that uh, part of your question again. How do you read or interpret river flows and put them in the context of a particular river? And how do you adjust your strategy accordingly? Well, river flow graphs and river flow information is hugely important if you know what you're looking at. It takes a little bit of context to understand completely. Basically, a river flow graph is meant to tell you how much water in cubic feet per second, or CFS, is moving through the river. All of the USGS graphs will have a median mark to show you where the quote-unquote normal flows are for that time period. During spring runoff, for example, you're going to see those flows increase, and in the fall and winter, the flows are usually going to be at their lowest. And you'll see the median mark so that you know if you're really higher, if it's a really big spring runoff or a really bad spring runoff, right? Now, all of this river flow data tells you, all all that that is telling you is how high the water is. If it's too high, it's obviously going to be really tough or sometimes even impossible to fish. If it's too low, it's also probably going to be really tough to fish or in the summer, The water could be so warm that you're potentially harming trout, so you shouldn't even go fish it anyways. All this information is helpful if you want to know that the river you're going to go fish is in shape, and you want to check those flows without having to go to the river on your own. So, for example, I love this little creek by my place back in Utah, but it was about an hour away. But luckily, there was a stream flow station where I knew if those flows were below 35 CFS, I was in business. I'd get out there. I could put the herd on those fish like nobody's business. I knew that river. Oh, I knew that river so good. <laughs> no, I'm, I am I loved that river. I don't know whether I knew it, but sometimes we like to think that we know things, and then you'll go get skunked and realize that you don't know anything. <laughs> so, oh, but that's what I use the flows for. It's really nice if you're planning a trip that's a little bit further away. It lets you know if the river's in shape. That's That's really what river flow graphs are for. So. Wonderful questions, Andrew. Thank you for the in-depth questions. I mean it. And yeah, keep questions like that coming. Those are fantastic. Last question of the show. It's hard to believe we're already just about done here. What is the difference between deer body and deer belly hair? Ethan from Manitoba sent that in. Manitoba, 
I believe that's our first international question. Ethan, thank you so much, man. Appreciate it. This is a great question. Deer belly hair is longer and coarser than deer body hair. So it's really ideal for hair body flies like a Dave's hopper or for spinning deer heads like your deer heads, deer hair heads. That's a tough one to say real quick. Deer hair heads, deer hair heads. Yeah, that'll twist your tongue right up on them. So you want to use deer belly hair for hair bodied flies or for spinning deer hair like an irresistible Adams or the spun deer heads that you see on patterns like a muddler minnow. So if you're tying patterns to hair bodies or spun hair heads, you want to use belly hair. Body hair is the item that's ideal for the wing on like an elk hair caddis, for example. So that's a really good question. And there's there's few distinct differences uh, with those hair types and what you're trying to do, what you're trying to tie. So thank you very much, Ethan. Appreciate it. And thank you, everybody, for listening to the end of the show. We really, really appreciate it. We're very stoked to uh, announce our new product stuff here in a few weeks on the show. And we can't wait to get the whole VFC brain trust together and chat with everybody. We're really looking forward to that. In the meantime, if you've got any questions at all about fly fishing that you would like answered, please do not hesitate to reach out to us. You can catch us on social media, uh, through our emails, uh, any way that you can think of getting a hold of us, even smoke signals. It's been really clear and crisp, cold air up here in Wyoming. So I can see for miles. I can see those smoke signals. Send them on up here. We'll take care of you. And until next week, everybody, tight lines.